Former Chinese leader Deng Xiaoping once said, It is important to hide your strength and bide your time. This statement explains China's behavior in past decades, when it maintained a low profile in international matters. But now, things have changed. China has changed a lot. It went from being one of the poorest countries in the world to a world superpower. Its economy is now flourishing. But why settle there when you can have more? China's Belt and Road Initiative, or the New Silk Road, is one of the most ambitious infrastructure projects ever conceived. It was launched in 2013 by President Xi Jinping. The vast collection of development and investment initiatives would stretch from East Asia all the way to Europe, significantly expanding China's economic and political influence. This is a globe-spanning plan, which has the goal of strengthening trade, infrastructure, and investment links between China and about 65 other countries. The countries participating in this initiative would account for more than 30% of global gross domestic product. That's huge. The New Silk Road is also referred to as the Belt and Road Initiative. The road refers to the maritime network of shipping lanes that go from China, through Southeast Asia, Africa, and all the way to Europe. The Belt refers to the overland routes and structures spanning from Asia to Europe. The most visible part of the Belt and Road so far has been infrastructure. Why is it called the New Silk Road? Well, to answer that question, it's time for a little history lesson. The original Silk Road arose during the expansion era of the Chinese Han Dynasty, which created trade networks throughout the Central Asian countries like Afghanistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, you get the point. These routes extended for thousands and thousands of miles, and they arrived in Europe. At that time, Central Asia was the epicenter of one of the first waves of globalization, connecting Eastern and Western markets, spurring immense wealth, and intermixing cultural and religious traditions. It was like the internet boom of ancient times. China sent their silk, spices, jade, and other goods to the West, while in exchange, it received gold and other precious metals, ivory, and glass products. Use of the route peaked during the first millennium, under the leadership of first the Roman and then the Byzantine empires, and the Tang Dynasty in China. As is true of almost everything in life, all good things have to come to an end at some point. The Crusades, as well as the advance of the Mongols, dampened trade, and the decimation of the region caused a lot of distrust, and eventually led many countries into isolationism. This has lasted all the way to today, as currently Central Asian countries are economically isolated from each other, with intra-regional trade making up just 6.2% of all cross-border commerce. They are also heavily dependent on Russia. President Xi's vision for the New Silk Road included creating a vast network of railways, energy pipelines, highways, and streamlined border crossings. Such a network would expand the international use of the Chinese currency, the Yuan. In addition to physical infrastructure, China plans to build 50 special economic zones, which are modeled after the Shenzhen Zone, which China launched in 1980 during its economic reforms under Deng Xiaoping. A special economic zone is one that is highly focused on manufacturing and migrant work. Only about 25% of the population in the Shenzhen Zone are permanent residents. Now, in 2020, China appears to be tightening its One Belt, One Road initiative. China has loaned more than half a trillion dollars in yuan to countries like Pakistan, Thailand, Sri Lanka, and when China asked for their money back, those countries said, well, we don't really have it right now. You're probably thinking, wow, that really stinks for China. But do you really think that China would loan half a trillion dollars to some of the poorest countries in the world and expect to get all of its money back? These countries had to put up very strategic assets as collateral when they accepted the loans. And when those assets inevitably fall into China's hands, the Asian country will undoubtedly be a severe force to be reckoned with on the world stage. In other words, the New Silk Road was a debt trap, and everybody fell for it. 
Have you had your loan application rejected by every major international financial institution? Is your credit so bad people steal your identity and then give it back? Do you have an expensive infrastructure project of questionable profitability? Well then go on down to Xi Jinping's financing barn. The number of articles mentioning the concept of debt trap in relation to China's foreign policy have skyrocketed in the past few years. In the beginning, most articles were from the United States, but soon it reached the global media. The trend even caught the attention of countries involved in the Belt and Road Initiative. In the initial stages of the Belt and Road, it seemed as if China was trying to rewrite the book on international development. The projects were bigger, more expensive, and riskier than the projects the world was used to seeing. This created a buzz and a sense of excitement. Could China step up onto the global stage and show everybody how it's done? But if China was supposed to show us how it's done, then why did I call it a debt trap? The news sparkled with headlines of multi-billion dollar deals, big moves, and action along the Belt and Road. But if anybody had taken the time to get a broader view of the situation, they would have realized that the majority of these deals were being made with countries that had credit ratings classified as junk. China was making big deals with countries like Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and Malaysia. These deals showed the initial propensity of the Belt and Road to shoot for quantity over quality, expediency over transparency. The reactions from this strategy was quickly felt across the entire network. It was in Sri Lanka that the deficiencies of China's international development activities were first revealed globally. The important point made here, our concern has always been about Sri Lanka and the people of Sri Lanka. So when you get into an agreement or a transaction which gives a different, another nation, total control of a commercial port, it gives us serious national security issues. So is Sri Lanka's national security under threat because China runs that port? China partnered with Sri Lanka's former president, Mahinda Rajapaksa, to build a series of infrastructure megaprojects in Hambantota a vastly undeveloped region on the island nation's southern coast. To start, the plan involved building a new deep sea port, an airport, a stadium, a giant conference center, and many miles of new roadways. All of these projects were funded with, you guessed it, loans from China. A few years later, Sri Lanka struggled to pay it back as the country sunk into a debt trap of its own making. China seized a 70% share of the deep sea port at Hambantota for 99 years for $1.12 billion. At first, this might seem fair. It might seem like a debt for equity swap, but news came out later that Sri Lanka actually used the money to beef up its foreign reserves and make some other foreign debt repayments to save itself from economic collapse. After this, the Chinese debt trap diplomacy theory was born. When the Belt and Road was first announced, Malaysian Prime Minister Najib Razak welcomed the initiative, and China immediately took over as the top source of foreign direct investment in Malaysia. According to the World Bank, between 2010 and 2016, nearly $36 billion was pumped into Malaysia by Chinese state-owned firms. Many big-ticket infrastructure projects, like the East Coast Rail Link project, and a massive port city called Malacca Gateway were started. Chinese firms bought up multiple Malaysian ports. Bonafide mega projects, such as the $100 billion, 250,000 person forest city, were being built with Chinese direction and financial backing. Everything seemed to be going just as planned, but then came some problems. News of the One Malaysia Development Burhad scandal and other scandals connected with the Prime Minister came out, as it was discovered that over $7.5 billion of government money had just disappeared. By the way, let us know in the comments if you'd like us to make a video on that. It seemed as if China was trying to help the embattled Prime Minister cover evidence of financial irregularities by artificially inflating the costs of infrastructure projects so the money in excess could be used for other purposes. This is definitely not legal but it seems as if this condition was included in the written agreements and contracts. This favor came with a catch. Malaysia had to give Chinese companies big stakes in national railway and pipeline projects, and permission for the Chinese Navy to use two Malaysian ports. This deal didn't come to pass, but it yet again cast the Belt and Road in a dubious light. 
There are many other examples of allegations of corruption up and down the Belt and Road. Bangladesh, for example, shut down a highway project that should have been built by the China Harbor Engineering Company because it seemed like the company was repeatedly offering a Bangladeshi official a bribe. Chinese tech giants such as Huawei and ZTE have been probed for wrongdoing in many Belt and Road Initiative countries, and the U.S. arrested the emissary of China's CEFC energy company for illegal payments to officials in Chad and Uganda. A 2017 survey by McKinsey found that 60 to 80 percent of Chinese companies in Africa admitted to paying bribes. At this point, it's clear that the Belt and Road Initiative does not keep good company. Most Belt and Road countries have poor debt ratings. They also don't score too well on international corruption indexes. Ten Belt and Road countries were deemed to be at a high risk of bribery. The lack of transparency and oversight as to what China is doing abroad was of concern in the early days of the Belt and Road. However, now the initiative has lost support due to scandals, debt traps, and failed projects that have emerged in recent years. Countries along the corridors are now operating with a lot more caution and scrutiny, pumping the brakes on many projects, and potentially setting the Belt and Road Initiative back for years to come. Hey guys, thanks for sticking to the end. We hope you enjoyed the video. We'll keep making these mini documentaries every week as long as you smash the like and subscribe buttons. Also, leave your thoughts in the comments. If you have any particular video you'd like to see, let us know.